So, sir, first I will introduce you. After that, I can share my screen. Okay. Yeah, sure. Hello and welcome to all. This is Ankana, the assigned moderator from IJCP Group. I wholeheartedly welcome all the delegates across the country. We are fortunate enough to get supported by the doctors. Thank you, all the doctors, for taking out time to join us today. Now I am taking this opportunity to welcome today's master doctor, none other than the eminent speaker, Dr. Pratik Tripathi, sir. Sir is MBBS, MD, DM in Nephrology. He is the head of Nephrology Department at the Multi-Speciality Fortis Escort Hospital, Jaipur. Now, with the help of Dr. Tripathi, sir, and his wonderful insights, we will be taking a close look on today's topic, which is innovation in renal transplant. Without any further delay, sir, I would like to hand over the session to you. Kindly proceed with your topic. Oh. Okay. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, today, we shall talk about uh, a very important burning issue. Uh, renal transplant. Uh, we know uh, what our patients go through. Uh, CKD patients, uh, stage five, they either have to be on dialysis or they go for transplant. Transplant apparently is still, you know, not so common in India as compared to other countries in the world. In other countries, lots of things are happening, especially in the U.S. and uh, Europe as well. And uh, they're, you know, getting a kidney, a new kidney uh, is obviously an issue everywhere because either you get the kidney from a living person who has to donate it or you get it from someone who is brain dead. Uh, that is a cadaver. So... These are the two sources of kidneys and people are trying to figure out if they can have another source. And we shall see some interesting things that have happened uh, in, uh, in this direction. So um, I begin with uh, some innovations which have been done in the US especially and are very much being practiced. In fact, they have been put into use over there. So uh, the previous slide, please, the previous slide. Yeah, so I'm going to talk about something known as the ex vivo normothermic machine perf perfusion of organs. We all know about cadaveric transplants. We know that the organs, once they are harvested from a brain dead person, have to be carried to the recipient who is generally in a different hospital, sometimes far away, several miles, several hundred miles away, sometimes a thousand miles away. So it has to be carried in, uh, uh, you know, by air, airlifted, then run, you know, carried in an ambulance and you have a green corridor and lots of drama and everything happening. Ah, meanwhile, the organ is being exposed to uh, hypoxia, the blood, because it's been taken out of the body and uh, the blood perfusion has stopped. So the organs, the, the organ is... Uh, subjected to hypoxia and obviously damage is occurring all this while. Now, some people, smart people uh, have come up, you know, they came up with the so-called uh, machine perfusion where they used uh, 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 fluid, uh, fluid like uh, Uni University of Wisconsin solution or Collins solution, which was, you know, of hypothermic, low temperature, and it was run through the organ with the hope that the low temperature is going to reduce the metabolism and reduce the uh, oxygen requirement of the tissue and protect it from hypoxia. But it also had its own issues, you know, hypo you know uh, hypothermia would itself cause damage to the organs. Um, so... Uh, people came up with the normal thermic machine perfusion of the organ. And uh, this particular organ, this machine is particularly being used for livers and it's called oximetra. And see, you can see it's a small machine. It's not very large. You have a blood reservoir, uh, uh, the blood, 
uh, is used as the perfusion fluid rather than using any other fluid. And along with the uh, blood, they have used um, some fluids, uh, a fluid which contains uh, some substances which protects which gives nutrition to the kidney to to the to the tissue uh, in this case the liver actually and um, and or uh, you know there is an oxygenator as well there is a pump which uh, which uh, makes the uh, blood go around and so this occurs in the normal body temperature so temperature is being maintained drugs are being given or uh, even antibiotic everything is being given and it's all no touch technique no touch technique and so the next slide could i have a smaller screen i'm not able to read the whole thing i mean it occupying yeah so uh, organ oximetra uh, it's perfused with oxygenated blood, medications and nutrients at body temperature and near physiological pressure and flows. And um, so basically, uh, you know, it also allows you to assess the function of the particular organ. You can draw blood, test, look for, uh, you know, urea, creatinine or LFTs if you are transporting a liver and uh, see whether the actual damage is occurring to the to the particular organ next slide so you have an oxygenator and uh, it just sub it supplies you know you don't need extra uh, oxygen from anywhere you need it just gets constant oxygen is concentrated from the air and you have this pump which is sending in blood at uh, the usual temp uh, blood pressures that the person is used to and you have a reservoir where the oxygenated blood is stored uh, and then you have medicines and nutrition nutrition as well next slide so this way you are able to keep the kidneys for a longer period of time uh, much longer more than 36 hours as a matter of fact which is extraordinary um, another a uh, great innovation that has taken place is you know we you know that we have shortage of organs a blood group a person a recipient uh, who has a blood group a can be given a kidney of either a or o same with b can be given only a kidney of b or o what if we uh, have a kidney which is A, which has to be given to a person who is B actually. So you, we already do ABO incompatible transplants. And uh, for that, you have to, you know, there, there is a protocol, you have to do plasmapheresis, you have to give rituximab, you have to start the immunosuppression much earlier. And, um, and uh, you have to look at the antibody titers. Uh, so it, it generally costs much more than, than, than the usual uh, ABO compatible transplants. And um, the first two, two, uh, two weeks generally are the uh, most nail biting uh, period after transplant where uh, antibody mediated rejections can occur. So creatinine can go up and things can go wrong. And in fact, sometimes you need, may have to do a plasma paresis after the uh, transplant. So to get rid of this, people at Oxford actually worked on this. So blood group conversion, what they did was they picked up a kidney, which was A, and uh, they subjected it to an enzyme treatment. Uh, under normothermic perfusion. We have already seen what normothermic perfusion is. And they, this enzyme treatment basically converted this A blood group kidney into O. Next slide. Yeah. So this is actually the blood groups A, B, O, and AB. And you can see uh, who can get which kidney. So uh, look Look at the structure of the blood groups, you will find that basically at the base of so-called every blood group, A or B, or AB for that matter, is the O, ah, that is the H. 
uh, H antigen. So if you remove the moiety using an enzyme, you just snip it off, you land up with an organ which is basically O, just has the H antigen, which is the base for all the other blood groups. And so, uh, you know, the trick was to find an enzyme uh, which would work in a, in a, a quantity that you can actually procure and use without causing damage to the organ. And uh, you have to, you know, uh, subject that organ to this particular enzyme for not very long. I mean, if it has to, if it is very long, then the organ is going to get damaged because of hypoxia. So next slide. So you have this, this is what I was talking about. You have this galnac deacetylase, which converts the uh, you know blood group into H antigen, just snips it, snips off the uh, the moiety, the galac the uh, polysaccharide moiety. Next slide. So uh, they they have done it in you know donor kidneys from brain dead people, and uh, they have used this normothermic uh, perfusion, and they found that uh, particular enzyme that they have. It requires five hours of treatment uh, to convert it into an O group, and uh, the treatment can easily be done. Ah, so this is something which is extremely feasible. Uh, next slide. Uh, now this is something even more interesting. Uh, the people in the U.S., uh, I believe it's Yale, yeah, uh, they came up with the organ X. Now, this is something known as uh, organ X. This is cellular recovery after prolonged warm ischemia of the whole body. Imagine someone dying in front of you. The heart stops and, uh, you know, one hour goes by. And then the, 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 the scientists come into action. They connect the body uh, to this organ X. And they perfuse this body with the fluid, and then you find the organs start working again. They kind of wake up. The brain also. Next slide. The brain also starts working. So they they carried it out on the pig. Here you have the pig, and this is an or this is a machine, a contraption which is very similar to the so-called heart lung machine. And instead of blood, they have used a special fluid which contains uh, substances like nutrients and antioxidants and things. And um, they perfused the, the so-called brain dead pig. And um, uh, the organs started working again. Next slide. Yeah. So this is at Yale, Dr. Nenad Sestan. And um, pig's own blood was uh, also used. And uh, perfusion of the pig began one hour after the cardiac arrest. So uh, they, they compared it to the other pigs uh, which were being subjected to ECMO. So the ECMO, next slide. Next, um, the, the finding was that the organs, uh, the cells of the heart, liver, kidneys, uh, they, and even the brain, they started functioning again. And uh, when they compared it to the pig where ECMO was being done, they found that um, the, uh, the uh, organ X perfusion uh, worked better at preserving the cells. So uh, we have, uh, the so-called in cadaveric transplant, we have this heart, uh, you have this brain dead where the heart continues to pump. And then you have this brain dead where the heart has stopped pumping. And this is uh, a very, uh, you know, a situation where you have to do everything very quickly, pick out the organs, everything, because the, the perfusion has stopped and the organs have already started, you know, uh, succumbing to uh, hypoxia because there is no perfusion. So here, if you rig up this 
person onto organ X, the organs would be preserved and they would be protected from hypoxia and you can take your sweet time to prepare your patient to, uh, you know, transplant this kidney. Uh, so, I mean, this is a major, uh, this is an extraordinary development. Next slide. Yeah, so this is a comparison. The first, uh, the, the, the first, uh, the one, the uh, photograph above is the kidney in the pig where the heart-lung machine was being used. You can barely see the kidney. But look at the second one where the organ X is being used. You can see the beautiful kidneys, they kind of stand out. And so and they are working much better. Next slide. Now, uh, this is um, something which is from the realm of so-called science fiction once upon a time. Now, some, uh, you know, people might be reminded of Isaac Asimov. But uh, frankly, this is uh, now the truth. I mean, these things are actually happening. There are people working on this, very smart people. And they, they, are, they are, from the look of things, they are going to succeed. Next slide. So you have these concepts where you want to generate new uh, nephrons and you have so-called inducible um, uh, stem cells. So you can make organoids of the kidney. You can have 3D, uh, 3D uh, printing of the kidney and you have kidney in a chip on a chip situation where you have small fragments on a chip, functional cells in a chip, uh, which are functional, which are actually working. Next slide. So um, kidney organoids are three-dimensional self patterning cell cultures that can model the basic structure and function of the organ. Uh, these are so-called uh, primordial model of the kidney. There are, uh, so I guess at some point, they are going to create the, 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 the whole kidney in the lab. So it's a direct, it's, it's, it's a work uh, in progress and seems that that is the end of and uh, desirable end then you have this 3d bioprinting where you know you already know 3d bioprinting i mean 3d printing is being done to make houses nowadays as a matter of fact so uh, why not make a kidney uh, with live cells uh, create the whole ultra structure so i mean kidney is very complicated uh, the, you have this but these blood vessels, glomeruli, and uh, tubules, and then you have those. Uh, you need an architecture, you know, uh, scaffolds to hold the whole whole thing together. You need the uh, uh, the capsule, everything. So obviously, it's a very difficult thing, and uh, uh, but but people are working on this. People are working on this. Uh, so they are using bioprinters with cells suspended in the so-called bioink uh, to create structures, and um, uh, probably someday they are going to succeed. Now you have this kidney on a chip where you have microfluidic chips with three-dimensional cell cultures, and they replicate the physiology of multiple organ types. You have organ on a chip, you have so-called pancreas, on a chip and you have heart on a chip so you have a kidney on a chip as well liver on a chip ah, so uh, you know they are working on this next slide uh, the scaffold uh, making the organ to make the organ you first need to create the so-called skeleton around which all the cells and the tissues have to be organized and kept into place so that they don't fall apart. So, you know, perfusion, decellularization, uh, this is where uh, uh, extracellular 
the matrix derived scaffolds are produced and cells are being sent there and apparently these scaffolds actually are uh, there for a reason when the organ forms inside uh, the embryo for example which cell needs to go where uh, so apparently it's not only the genes directing what to do where to go but the the extracellular matrix also helps there are substances which are being formed outside the cell which tell them where to go ah, so uh, so people are working on this as well so biological and non -bio biological scaffolds as well next slide now something i mean dialysis for example is obviously kind of cumbersome and sometimes irritating for the patient you know he has to go to a particular place he has to lie down for four hours then he comes back he has to drop everything uh, his life has to stop for that particular period of time so imagine uh, doing whatever you are doing while getting dialysis i mean for example you know traveling um, driving a car and getting your dialysis as well i mean this is something obviously capd was something uh, which was very close to achieving this a result but then at the end of the day we know what happens in CAPD the person has to come back home and you know make the exchange what if the exchange takes place on its own what if the machine uh, to which the patient has been hooked on does everything and the patient doesn't have to do anything and he can go about his life as if as if uh, you know he's not actually getting a dialysis next slide so you have various, you know, so-called wearable dialysis apparatuses. You have generally, you know, uh, those which do peritoneal dialysis. And then you have a machine which does so-called uh, hemodiafiltration or hemofiltration. Next slide. Yeah, this is the, so the, the famous Vincenza wearable artificial kidney for peritoneal dialysis. Um, the fluid uh, goes in the, into the peritoneal cavity, then it comes out and then it's regenerated and then it goes back and this goes on and on in a cycle and the person doesn't really have to do much, maybe change cassettes where the regeneration takes place. Next slide. You have another PD-based uh, system known as AVAC. Next slide. Uh, this is also the same thing, AVAC. Next slide. Same thing. So uh, these are actually in uh, use right now. The people are actually using, but they are kind of Expensive, number one. Number two, uh, they haven't really caught people's fancy that much because they are kind of cumbersome at the moment. And uh, they may there may be a tendency towards malfunction or people really don't have that kind of faith in the, system, in, in, in the, the apparatus at the moment. So I would rather put them in the so-called experimental category. Next slide. Yeah, this is uh, ultra filtration. This is basically a uh, hemofiltration device. Next slide. Yeah, this is dialysate regeneration method. Mm. Next slide. Now, uh, something very interesting is taking place in the US and um, in fact, uh, one of the engineers involved is one Dr. Shuva Roy, and uh, Dr. Roy, and uh, in collaboration with uh, a nephrologist, uh, is very close to a, you know, a, a great breakthrough. Next slide. Next slide. Yeah, this is the initial 
uh, system which was proposed about a decade ago. And uh, based on this, something much better because of the current technology that we have has come up. Next slide. The implantable bioartificial kidney. This is what I wanted to tell you about. So this is the small kidney. Instead, you know, the, when we do transplant, we put the kidney exactly here where this uh, this device has been placed and is almost the same situation occurs. You have the artery, arterial anastomosis, you have the venous anastomosis, and then you have the ureter, which has to be implanted into the uh, bladder. So here, this device actually does, you implant this device as if you are doing a transplant. Next slide. So uh, this is a high volume connect convective ultra filter, uh, you know, ultra filtration by silicon uh, nanoporous membrane. Now this is because of the present day innovations, we have these uh, silicon uh, nanoporous membrane which can do this very small member small uh, membranes and uh, they selectively reabsorb the electrolytes and water and uh, so they take care they do the ultra filtration and uh, toxin clearance occurs and then calcium phosphorus all those things are taken care of and uh, potassium regulation also is taken care of. And uh, however, here, uh, there would be no erythropoietin. So the person would need erythropoietin from outside. He would continue to need some medicines. Next slide. And then you have the acid-base balance and everything. And you have actual living cells, tubular cells within within which do the exchanges. Ah, so uh, all, all these exchanges, like what happens in the tubules after filtration uh, takes place here as well, replicated uh, within this artificial kidney. Next slide. And uh, it's been successful in the animals and probably in few maybe two years to five years we would have it and once we have it um maybe when, uh, if it works really as it is it promises uh, then you know um, you, who would need a kidney who would need a transplant who would need no one would need a transplant anymore uh now something very interesting has happened and uh, that is xenotransplantation now, people had thought of this. There was, I mean, if wonder, I wonder if you remember uh, several years ago, there was this news from Assam. Some doctor from Hong Kong, cardiac surgeon, landed there, reared some pigs, bioengineered pigs, and did a cardiac transplant. The gentleman lived for a few days and then died, and there was a lot of hullabaloo and... Um, People were actually arrested. And uh, anyway, uh, well, uh, that was a great idea, actually. So next slide. Uh, this is something which has actually happened now in the US. So they bioengineered a pig. They bioengineered the pigs. They removed some genes uh, from the pig's gene. And... Uh, they they put in some human genes in that pig and uh, by surrogacy they you know got this pig uh, uh, you know fertilized pig it came out and then they sacrificed they took out his kidney and put it in a, a brain dead person and it worked next slide yeah so these are the things which were done stepwise. This is what I'm talking about. Uh, they had to make sure that the pig was pathogen free and they looked for so-called um, uh, genes which, uh, you know, uh, uh, retroviruses, 
you know, in our bodies, for example, when you get infected by a particular virus, its genes also tend to integrate with your genes. So they can cause problems for you. For example, cancer, a lot of cancers occur because of that. Hepatitis B, for example, causing hepatocellular carcinoma. Uh, so, so they remove those uh, particular genes. They wanted to be absolutely sure that it was a safe procedure. So they removed those genes. They removed particular genes uh, uh, which uh, caused, uh, which produced uh, proteins which would be recognized by the uh, human immune system and cause uh, immediate rejection. So they did that as well. And they introduced some, they also removed some genes which, uh, you know, would produce complements. Uh, you know, complement activation doesn't play, take place so that the complement activation doesn't take place. And uh, they introduced some human genes as well. Next slide. Yeah. So they use the CRISPR technology. Now, someone actually got a Nobel Prize for this, this technology for gene editing. Ah. So winning Quinn in Cambridge, Massachusetts, uh, used this to produce the donor pigs. The glycan antigens were identified. There were three glycan antigens uh, which were identified and they were removed. And uh, then human transgenes were introduced, seven human transgenes were introduced to reduce the primate immune systems uh, of the uh, hostility. And uh, they, they removed the porcine endogenous retrovirus uh, viruses, uh, the genes of these viruses. And they produced the so-called uh, 10GE pigs that is 10 genetic modifications and uh, these uh, the 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 all the kidney was taken from this pig and given to a brain dead person next slide so human um, stem cells were also there, there's something known as uh, you know Blastocyst. Now, that, that, that was the so-called um, xenotransplantation, which worked, and uh, uh, it's going to work. It seems it's going to work now, and it would be introduced for proper human beings, you know, prop, not brain-dead human beings, proper human beings. Now, there's, people have worked on another uh, way of doing something like blastocyst complementation. Now, what they did was they edited the gene of the pig so that the pig would not produce a particular organ, for example, the heart. And then they added the human uh, stem cells from a person who needed a heart transplant. They produced this, uh, uh, this uh, chimeric uh, blastocyst, which was impl implanted within... Uh, a surrogate uh, so and then the piglet was is born and the piglet now has a heart now this heart is almost wholly built of uh, the human stem cells which belong to the gentleman who required the heart in the first place so almost no pig uh, tissue in this heart mo almost most of it human and then all you need to do is sacrifice the pig, take out the heart and put it inside that person. And that person wouldn't even need immunosuppression because it is his own, it is made up of his own body, you know, his own tissues. Now, this is a great idea. I don't know how far it has gone, but it, it seems to be working in certain situations like, you know, islet cells, for example. Next slide. Yeah, blastocyte complementation. Next slide. Blastocyte complementation. Uh, now, macrochimerism. Macrochimerism is uh, 
uh, chimera means an organ which uh, 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 not an organ a uh, uh, an animal which has parts from different other animals so people are trying to create such an animal as i have already talked about the uh, the blastocyst complementation which is actually a chimera and uh, one can do something beyond that one can actually do a, a bone marrow transplant in this particular animal introduce the human stem cells in the pig and uh, the pig would be born with much more human tissues and then uh, you know you would be able to go through the uh, barrier you know the the organ can be then the pig can be uh, sacrificed and the organ can be used for transplant next slide so immunologic tolerance protocols are being worked on Imagine a situation where you don't need uh, immunosuppression at all. I mean, you just, for example, twins. Now, twins, if a twin, if you have twins, and the first transplant, renal transplant was between twins, actually. And so uh, it worked beautifully because immunosuppression was not really required. Uh, so next slide. So you have immune tolerance where the donor bone marrow transplantation along with the regulatory cell therapy along with nanoparticle based therapy. <clears throat> These things are being used for immunologic tolerance and uh, people have really worked hard on this. Uh, I know uh, people in um, IKD, you have this uh, IKD in Ahmedabad. They worked on this for years all together and they did get some success. From uh, next slide. <coughs> Mixed chimerism through bone marrow transplantation. And uh, this, this is actually uh, a doable thing. Next slide. Regulatory cell therapy uh, by using uh, cell-based medical products containing containing tregs and uh, dendritic cells and macrophages to reduce the need for immunosuppression and with reduced infectious complications. Imagine no immunosuppression, so no infection. Next slide. Nanoparticle therapy is being thought of. Uh, giving the uh, rapamycin, for example, in uh, silicon nanoparticles to target the particular cells. I mean, these would be very minuscule amount of immunosuppression directed into the particular cells which cause the trouble of, uh, you know, uh, rejection uh, with almost zero effect on the rest of the immune system, letting, you know, keeping the rest of the immune system intact to tackle with the infections and everything. Next slide. Uh, next slide. So that's all. Okay, That fine. was the I last think, slide. Yeah, okay, fine. I think um, I've come to the last slide. Um, if you have any questions, um, I would be glad to answer them. Sorry, sir. If anyone has questions, I'll be glad to answer them. Yes. So, sir, thank you so much for taking our time and for sharing such beautiful insights to us, to with our doctors. Sir, we have received few questions from our participating doctors. With all your permission, can I put them across? Yes, sir. Okay. So, the first question is, how do innovations in renal transplantation impact long-term graft survival and patient outcomes? Yeah, we were basically talking about that. Not <clears throat> the innovations. Innovations are directed towards number one, getting one art, the getting an organ. Number two, ensuring that that organ actually works with minimal or no immunosuppression. So imagine, I mean, uh, as I talked about 
uh, micro chimerism and even macro chimerism and blastocyst, uh, you know, implantation and everything. Here we are talking about creating an organ inside an animal, and this organ would basically be human tissue, and this the tissue would be belonging to the person who is get going to get this organ, and this. This organ would be placed inside this human being, and this human being is not going to require uh, any immunosuppression. So, if, for example, I mean, when you get a so called hair transplant, what happens? Hair from your own body is taken out from one place and transplanted on another place on, on your body, another site on your body. You don't require special medications, and it works beautifully, doesn't it? So, uh, uh, same thing with the organ. Your own body part is being put inside you. You're not going to require immunosuppression and it's going to live long enough. I mean, you're going to have a brand new heart or a brand new kidney. And um, so, I mean, nothing like it. So, all the innovations in transplant are directed towards uh, so-called graft, enhancing graft function, improving quality of life of the patient and increasing his lifespan. Okay, moving to the next question, that is, what challenges exist in translating innovations into tangible improvements in patient-centered outcomes? Yeah, we, we just noticed, we, we, we discussed all the so-called innovations, and uh, you notice that we, we are talking about pigs, you know, pig heart, pig kidney, and I also gave you this, uh, told you about this incident that actually happened in India where the doctors were actually put behind bars. And uh, they, 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 they came up with this innovation of creating a genetic uh, pig where they took out the heart of this pig and they put it inside a human being and he lived for a few days. Uh, so... Uh, all the prejudices with, that exist in the society would come into play. Uh, would you want a heart that was inside a pig once? Uh, you, you might start thinking, no, that's not a good idea. So, the, you know, a very typical prejudice. Your religious prejudice would always come into play. And, um, of course, the risk of transmission of uh, viruses. You know, we already know how... You, we, we have already gone through the COVID pandemic and this particular virus existed in bats and then somehow jumped onto the humans and, you know, uh, we created such havoc all over the world. So imagine putting in an organ from, a, from an animal and introducing a new virus which creates God knows what, does what to your body, what kind of disease. I mean, those, those that, that, that is a real danger. Huh? So that's why you, you, uh, we saw what they did with the retro ret retroviruses, uh, you know, genetic material within the, the, the pigs. Huh? So th that risk is also there. And of course, you have the immune barrier. So uh, xenotransplantation has always been difficult. You have uh, once upon a time, even blood transfusions was a big, big thing. You know, people didn't know that there was something called blood groups and they would transfuse blood from one person to the other and the fellow would just die. Now they figured out that there was something wrong and they did, that they didn't know about and they worked on it and they figured out why that, would, that happens. And now you can safely give blood and safely take blood transfusions. Same thing with the pigs. People have figured out that there are certain antigens in the pigs which are recognized by humans because humans apparently don't have the, the, those particular uh, you know, uh, genetic material and that's why uh, they strongly reject the organs. And so they simply deleted those particular uh, uh, genes from the pig and they created uh, a new pig, a mutant pig, which could be acceptable to the human body. So these 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 are the various things, you know, and uh, let's see. Uh, is from the look of things, uh, the way innovations are coming, and uh, 
with artificial intelligence and everything, uh, we are not very far away from major breakthroughs. Next. Okay. The next question is, what challenges and opportunities arise with the integration of telehealth in renal transplantation management? Telehealth, uh, telehealth, well, you can't have nephrologists everywhere and you can't have uh, transplant uh, centers everywhere. So obviously telehealth is uh, comes in a big way to take care of these problems. A per, imagine a person sitting in the hills for, uh, you know, in uh, maybe Pori Garwal, for example, getting a transplant uh, in uh, Delhi. And then how, how does he contact his nephrologist? So telehealth uh, helps a lot. There you know, you would have all the investigations, his vitals, his, uh, he, you would be facing him face to face on uh, on the screen, and then you can actually give him the full treatment. In fact, you, at some point in the future, you would probably not require an actual nephrologist taking care of these problems. The AI algorithms will figure out, because in transplant, uh, things are very mathematical. If something is happening, then these are the possible causes and these are the possible things that you need to do. It's very mathematical. And you can actually come up with AI algorithms to take care of a lot of things uh, that occur in renal transplant. So tele uh, yeah, it's going to work out. Yes. Any more? Okay. Can you discuss the potential of tissue engineering in creating bioengineered kidneys for transplantation? Yeah, I just did, did that. I talked about or uh, I did. I talked about or or so called organoids. Where people and I talked about three D uh, bioprinting. Yeah, three D bioprinting where people are creating actual organs or tissues um, in the lab. So uh, tissue bioengineering. Uh, and I'm talk I talked about the uh, so-called uh, organ in a chip, huh? uh, things like that. So I have already talked about it. Yes. Okay, we are taking the last question for today's session. That is, how can advancements in molecular diagnostics enhance monitoring and management of renal transplant recipients? Yeah, my, my, see, a lot of times, for example, Nowadays, it's not necessary to actually go ahead with a biopsy every time there's a renal dysfunction. There are people working on this, uh, you know, before the actual creatinine starts going up, uh, the rejection process is already at its peak. It's already moving ahead. Uh, and uh, by the time creatinine is high, the, the, the disease process is also pretty far advanced. So a lot of things are already happening and you, you can't actually figure that out. So how can you figure that out? You can figure that out by looking at the urine. Uh, you would have uh, DNA fragments uh, in the urine because cells are being destroyed in the kidney because of rejection. So you can pick that up. If the if the donor if the donor uh, DNA is picked up in the urine, uh, then you can figure out that damage to the organ is taking place, and uh, uh, you can pick up the particular you know in, even in the blood the particular cell types which are involved in rejection process. Uh, they produce cytokines, and those cytokines levels tend to go up. You can monitor that, and you can. Uh, figure out that something is going wrong somewhere uh, before actual damage takes place. So uh, molecular methods are uh, uh, gaining, you know, pace right now. A lot of people are working on this. And uh, let's see where we go from here. Okay. Thank you so much, sir, for answering all the queries of our doctors. And I would also like to thank all the participating doctors for your continuous participation at our platform. 
Thank you once again, sir, for your valuable time and for being with us at our platform and sharing such valuable insights. So, Thank sir, you. with all your permission, we can can we just stop the live now? Yeah, sure. Thanks. Okay, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much.